Sign up for my newsletter at historyasithappens.com. Every Friday morning, you'll get an email from The Washington Times, where I'll share the stories behind the stories we talk about on the podcast and the thinking that goes into each episode. New episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. My newsletter every Friday at historyasithappens.com. History as it happens, November 10th, 2022, when Volcker ruled. We must whip inflation right now. A most serious domestic problem. That problem is inflation. When Mr. Carter became president, inflation was 4.8%. As you said, it had been cut in two by President Gerald Ford. It is now running at 12.7%. 36 cents. That's what this 1960 dollar is worth today. In fact, I cannot conceive of how tightening the money supply and driving up interest rates, which are are already too high, would be good for the health of the American economy. Inflation is the defining word of our time. As the Fed fights it by incrementally raising interest rates, inflation continues to eat into Americans' earnings, fueling pessimism that prices will not come down soon. A generation ago, the Fed was led by a chairman who took a sledgehammer to inflation by sending interest rates sky high, leading to deep recession in the early 1980s. Paul Volcker is lionized today, but would his approach work now? That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. If you have a high rate of inflation, if there are strong fears of rising rates of inflation, if you have tremendous demands on the credit markets from government or elsewhere, there's nothing that we can do over a period of time to keep interest rates down. Volcker gained courage to fight inflation because he knew that the public was sick and tired of it. An economic crisis leaves workers jobless. It can bring on financial ruin for individuals and businesses, erasing savings accounts or causing shortages of vital goods. But more than all of that, a recession or depression can produce a kind of social paralysis by darkening our outlook, our expectation that the future will be better. So, as a result, we might stop spending money, stop doing the things that make life livable, like going out to eat or taking vacations. By the late 1970s, inflation had been so bad for so long, it defined American life. In 1978, President Carter delivered a nationally televised address to talk about what he called our most serious domestic problem. That problem is inflation. For the prior decade, said Carter, the annual inflation rate had averaged 6.5%. Any progress in reducing inflation had proved fleeting. But until we have a convincing prospect of controlling inflation... I will oppose any further reductions in federal income taxes. So in 1979, Carter appointed Paul Volcker, chairman of the Federal Reserve. And Volcker announced a major change in monetary policy. Rather than incrementally raising interest rates, Volcker tightened the money supply. And that sent interest rates soaring. The prime rate nearly doubled by Election Day 1980, peaking at more than 21 percent. The economy tipped into a recession, not exactly what Jimmy Carter wanted as he faced Ronald Reagan in the presidential election that year. Inflation, government spending, deficits dominated their first debate. The most recent figures, the last three months of the third quarter of this year, the inflation rate is 7 percent. Still too high, but it illustrates very vividly that in addition to providing an enormous number of jobs, nine million new jobs in the last three and a half years, that the inflationary threat is still urgent on us. I noticed that Governor Reagan recently mentioned the Reagan-Kemp-Roth proposal, which his own running mate, George Bush, described as voodoo economics and said that it would result in a 30 percent inflation rate. And Business Week, which is not a democratic publication, said that this Reagan-Kemp-Roth proposal, and I quote them, I think, was completely irresponsible and would result in inflationary pressures which would destroy this nation. When Mr. Carter became president, inflation was 4.8 percent, as you said. It had been cut in two by President Gerald Ford. It is now running at 12.7 percent. President Carter also has spoken of the new jobs created. Well, we always, with the normal growth in our country and increase in population, increase the number of jobs. But that can't hide the fact that there are 8 million 
Men and women out of work in America today, and two million of those lost their jobs in just the last few months. Mr. Carter had also promised that he would not use unemployment as a tool to fight against inflation. And yet his 1980 economic message stated that we would reduce productivity and gross national product and increase unemployment in order to get a handle on inflation because in January, at the beginning of the year, it was more than 18%. Since then, he has blamed to the people for inflation, OPEC. He's blamed the Federal Reserve System. He has blamed the lack of productivity of the American people. He has then accused the people of living too well and uh, that we must share in scarcity, we must sacrifice and get used to doing with less. We don't have inflation because the people are living too well. We have inflation because the government is living too well. Well, as we know, Reagan trounced Carter, but soon received his own taste of Volcker's medicine. With budget deficits exploding in large part because of Reagan's tax cut, businesses failing and the stock market tanking, and with inflation falling but still too high, Volcker's tight money policy produced what historian Sean Wilentz described as an intentional recession of surpassing severity. Interest rates peaked at 19 percent, but inflation eventually came down to about 6 percent by 1982, 3 percent the following year. For Volcker, mission accomplished, but the pain caused by his approach was not forgotten by politicians. During Volcker's 1983 Senate reconfirmation hearing, Senator Jim Sasser, a Tennessee Democrat, blamed Volcker's policies for the economic ruin of the past half decade. I will cast my vote against your reappointment as chairman of the Federal Reserve Board because I believe the monetary policies followed by the Federal Reserve Board since October of 1979 have stymied the economic growth of this country and seriously damaged our economy. Our current economic problems can be traced in considerable measure to the high interest rate policies of the Federal Reserve. Unemployment still stands at 10% in this country. 11 million Americans are unemployed. And during 1982, the Congressional Budget Office has estimated that some 28 million people were unemployed at one point during the year. The chairman made no apologies. If you have a high rate of inflation, if there are strong fears of rising rates of inflation, if you have tremendous demands on the credit markets from government or elsewhere, there's nothing that we can do over a period of time to keep interest rates down. In other conditions, with confidence about the inflation outlook, uh, with government deficits under control, uh, there is nothing, in fact, the Federal Reserve could do to hold interest rates up under those circumstances over a period of time. So our influence, uh, in a direct sense, seems to me a short-run influence. Today, in the 21st century, inflation is proving more stubborn than many Americans, economists, even the Federal Reserve itself expected. But Jerome Powell is not expected to follow Volcker's drastic policies exactly. William Silber has been working as an economist since the 1970s in an array of public and private sector capacities. Today, he's a senior advisor at Cornerstone Research after having taught finance and economics at the NYU Stern School of Business. And he is the author of the 2012 biography, Volcker, The Triumph of Persistence. William Silber, welcome. I'm happy to be here. You can call me Bill Martin. All right, Bill. So I've been debating here whether to start with the history or at the present time. We'll go with current events. How about that? How do you rate Jay Powell's job performance? He is very much under the microscope trying to get inflation under control. Well, the story hasn't ended yet. So, you know, you want to you want to be careful about judging too soon. But until now, he's done a very, very poor job. I think he puts himself almost in the in the same grouping as Arthur Burns, who was responsible for the the great inflation, the 1970s. I think that the current problems we have are almost clearly due to at least two things that went on over the past two years under Chairman Powell. And what are those? The two mistakes that the Fed made under Chairman Powell began in August of 2020, when the Fed said that it would no longer target 2% inflation precisely, but it said it would target 2% inflation per year on average. 
when you average things, you can go a little above 2%. You can go to 3 or 4 as long as uh, afterwards you go down to 1 or 2 to offset that. But that was a substantive change because it opened the door to the word transitory. The one where no one can agree on the definition, right? So I think the word transitory has different meanings to different people. To to many, it carries a time, a sense of of short-lived. Well, even if you take the Merriam-Webster dictionary's definition, transitory is temporary. If I target 2% inflation per year, I don't let even a transitory uh, excursion above 2%. By allowing an averaging process, I think the Fed and Chairman Powell allowed themselves the leeway to allow inflation to go up because they thought it was transitory. As I like to remind my listeners, I am not an economist. I am not a practitioner of the dismal science. So to my untrained eyes, this incremental approach to raising rates does not seem to be working. Would a more brute force approach work better, raise rates by a point? Or, well, we're, the horse is out of the barn. This would have had to have been done way back in March, right? But I also understand why there are serious objections to a single massive rate hike. Let me uh, just respond to another thing that you just said, and that is they should have raised the rates earlier. The second big mistake that the Fed made, and maybe even bigger than this August 2020 mistake, was in the middle of 2021, Chairman Powell said that he was not going to raise rates preemptively. Preemptively means before he sees inflation. And this was a major change from the policy that the Fed had followed since Paul Volcker slayed inflation in the early 1980s. Preemptive restraint means you don't wait until you see inflation. You start worrying when the economy is rising so that you know that inflation will probably come. So you raise rates preemptively. Every chairman since Paul Volcker has done that. And in my mind, that's what gave us 40 years of uh, low inflation and stability. And Chairman Powell made a serious mistake by saying very explicitly, I'm going to wait until inflation, until I see it, until I see the white of its eyes. That's a serious error. Do you agree that a sense set in among lay people like myself, politicians, policymakers, that inflation wasn't going to come roaring back? The idea that we had kicked inflation, although, as one of my earlier guests mentioned, Thomas Honig, The overly accommodative monetary policy for the past decade, 0% rates, was bound to cause inflation at one time or another. Well, I don't know whether 0% rates were bound to cause inflation because there were a whole bunch of other reasons that people gave for those low rates. For example, Ben Bernanke, who was the chairman of of the Fed from 2004 through 2012, argued that there was a glut of savings in the world that drove down interest rates. And that could have been the case. So it's not clear that uh, low interest rates will always produce inflation. But when you see the economy recovering, when you see big fiscal deficits like we started in 2020 to combat the pandemic, you can't move ahead with both barrels firing for expansion. When you had expansionary fiscal policy, it was time to cut back on monetary policies, expansionary policies. The failure to do that almost certainly gave inflation. I said as much publicly in the in 2020. 
Well, as you know, a lot of this is arcane to the average American citizen and consumer, but uh, inflation is getting as much attention now as it ever has in the past generation or so. Another question or two about the current moment before we start talking about Paul Volcker. In the political realm, who caused inflation? Well, the party in power, according to the party that's out of power. But it is fair to say that government spending contributes to inflation. But there are also global factors. There are high gas prices. What does Bill Silber say about the causes, plural, of the current inflation? Well, the problem with high gas prices and the problem with the Ukraine war is that they occurred after the inflation was out of the bag. In other words, if you go into the middle of 2021, inflation had already hit five or 6%. It was time then to start tightening. This was not high gas prices back then. Crude oil prices were well below $70 a barrel. So to blame the current inflation on high gas prices and the war in Ukraine and all of the other bottlenecks associated with the war is really after the fact. And we forget now, oh, inflation is 9%, but it was 6.5% in the middle of 2021. None of those effects were present at back then. So why was it 6.5% then? Government well, spending, loose monetary policy? We needed a big boost in March of 2020 because the pandemic had threatened to destroy the financial system. And the Fed had to ease up in March of 2020, which it did. And you may need, you may have needed some expansionary fiscal policy, but by the fall of 2020, that's the fall of 2020, I'm not talking about 2021, by the fall of 2020, it was time to take away some of those expansionary policies. The easiest one to do would be monetary policy because it can act much more quickly than fiscal policy. Failure to rein in expansionary monetary policy in the fall of 2020 is what I think was the major cause of the current inflation. And what about the fact the government was cutting people checks, right? There was stimulus. People had lots of money to spend. And then eventually there was a supply shock. It was hard to get certain products. Was that a factor too? Oh, sure. When you say people were getting checks, That is fiscal policy. That is the government just giving you money. You might have needed that, but you didn't need both. You did not need both expansionary monetary policy, which kept interest rates too low for too long during the upturn after the pandemic was under control. And you did not need that plus the stimulus checks. So maybe we'll circle back to the present moment at the end of the conversation. I'd like to dive into the history now to see if there are any parallels, any guides that might help us get out of this jam today. I want to start by talking about the climate in the country in the late 1970s. I really don't have living memory of it. I was born in 75. But as I said at the top of the podcast, a persistent, seemingly intractable economic crisis can cause a kind of social paralysis or pessimism about the country's future. How did Americans feel about what was going on in the late 1970s? One of the things that gave Paul Volcker the courage to tighten monetary policy, to raise interest rates to unheard of levels, 20%. How could you do that in good conscience? How could you throw millions of people out of work. What gave him the courage to do that? What gave him, I would say, the backbone to do that? And he always said, because public opinion was sick and tired of prices rising during the 1970s. And everybody knew it, including Congress, but Congress didn't have the guts to do anything. So it turned the job over to Paul Volcker. 
The Federal Reserve is independent. It's not independent of Congress. Congress can abolish the Federal Reserve just by a simple majority vote. But Congress didn't want the job to tighten. They would lose the elections. So they turned it over to Paul Volcker and they screamed and yelled at him, but did nothing to stop him. And the only reason that Volcker was able to restrain the inflationary pressures was because the public had gotten sick and tired of rising prices. Would you say that the public had come to expect that prices were going to stay high permanently, that inflation could not be defeated? The public didn't only think that prices would stay high. They said that inflation would accelerate, which is what it did throughout the 1970s. Let me just go back all the way to the beginning. This didn't start in the middle of the 1970s. It started at the end of the 1960s during the Vietnam War, when you had a massive increase in government spending. And many economists, including those in the government, said you've got to raise taxes. You can't have guns and butter. If you're going to have guns, you got to cut back on the butter. But nobody did that. And you had 5% inflation in 1969. It sounds small today. It was unheard of then. And then you didn't have enough tightening by the central bank during the early 1970s. The chairman of the Federal Reserve then was Arthur Burns. He helped Richard Nixon get elected in 1972. And when he tightened credit, if people forget, in 1974, there was 11% inflation in the United States. That was the first double digit inflation. He tightened credit, but as soon as unemployment rose, he eased up again. And all the gains from tightening credit disappeared. And you then had a continuous ratcheting in inflation so that if you thought about buying something, you had better buy it before you needed it because it would only go up in price. And that is the danger of accelerating inflation. That's right. There was a seesaw there through the 1970s with inflation going up and down, interest rates going up and down. And I referred to a social paralysis before that can set in. People will stop spending money. They'll stop going out to restaurants and doing the things that make life livable, taking vacations if they feel like the the future is going to be so unstable and unpredictable. About the 1970s and the pre-Volcker period when inflation started rising, and you said double digits for the first time there, the Fed wasn't entirely independent or didn't act that way. You talked about how Burns acceded to Nixon's demands to help him win re-election. Volcker changed that, right? He basically didn't care what politicians thought of him. Well, you know, it took a while to get from Burns to Volcker. William Miller became the chairman of the Federal Reserve in 1978. But he wasn't able to do anything. And Jimmy Carter, who, you know, he had a whole bunch of reasons that he wasn't reelected. But the one that gave him great credibility was appointing Paul Volcker as chairman of the Federal Reserve. Volcker gained courage to fight inflation because he knew that the public was sick and tired of it. Let me just say one thing about uh, inflation. Many people say, well, what's the big deal? After all, if prices are going up by 5 or 10% and your wages are going up by 10%, why should you care? The main reason Volcker felt so strongly about fighting inflation was that he believed that inflation causes distrust in government. The trust that the government will keep its word. We give the government the right to print money, but we don't want them to debase the currency. And as soon as you see the government just allowing prices to go up, that undermines trust. And that is why the real reason for fighting inflation. Well, he believed inflation had become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So to your point about, so what if a 
gallon of milk is now a dollar fifty instead of a dollar twenty five or whatever it is it was in the nineteen seventies. He argued that sure your your wages kept going up, and then you would continue to spend those higher wages on higher priced products, and inflation would never get under control. It would continue to spiral higher and higher. History proved him correct, did it not? Yes, I think that's an, another reason for worrying about inflation is that. inflation doesn't stop at 5%. There's nothing magical about 4%, 5%, or 6%. And if it continues to go up, that will just accelerate the kind of spending that people undertake to get ahead of the rate of inflation. And of course, that causes inflation to spiral still higher. And Volcker found himself as Fed chair, I don't want to say by accident, but this was an inflection point in history. Carter gives his crisis of confidence speech in July of 79. So I want to speak to you first tonight about a subject even more serious than energy or inflation. I want to talk to you right now about a fundamental threat to American democracy. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We can see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our own lives and in the loss of a unity of purpose for our nation. And then he stuns everybody by trying to show that he's a man of action and in control of things, reshuffling his entire cabinet. So he takes Miller from the Fed and puts him as Treasury Secretary, and that's how Volcker winds up becoming Fed Chairman. So what does he do after his appointment? He doesn't raise rates, right? He instead controls the money supply, and that sends rates higher. Why is that important? Well, there was a huge debate in economics back then, which, you know, it's almost technical, but it turned out to be very important. Should you target interest rates or should you target money supply. And until then, everybody was trying to keep interest rates rising. And you want to raise interest rates. The problem with the Fed was they always did it too little, too late. So what Volcker did was say, look, I'm going to follow this money supply strategy by keeping reserves fixed. Well, if you keep reserves fixed and there's a lot of demand for spending, that will force interest rates up. And it allowed Volcker to let interest rates go to unprecedented levels and say, it's not the Fed that's doing it, it's the market that's doing it. And when rates hit 20%, an unheard of level in history, at least in American history, the answer was the marketplace is pushing rates up. The Fed isn't. All we're doing is keeping reserves constant. And that was the change that allowed the Federal Reserve to continue tightening monetary policy and fighting inflation well beyond what it would have done otherwise. So that first hike, if you will. That reaches, as you said, about 20 percent. It tips the economy into recession in 1980 in an election year. What does Jimmy Carter say or do about this? He complained. He said, here, I did the right thing and and appointed an inflation hawk, and it costs me the presidency. And it certainly helped Ronald Reagan. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Is it easier for you to go and buy things in the stores than it was four years ago? And what happened was the United States did go into a deep recession. The recession lasted, I'm gonna skip over a quick one, but it lasted until the middle of 1982. And the Fed allowed rates to stay high through 1982. By 1982, the inflation rate, which had been about 12%, came down to 4%. So a recession does eliminate, does reduce inflation. The problem is, as you start to come out of the recession, what do you do? And this is where Paul Volcker produced the lesson that goes through to today. And that is, as the economy started to recover, In 1984, 
while the unemployment rate was 7.5%, he started to raise rates again, raising it preemptively before the inflation started up again. And that's what ultimately controlled the rate of inflation. And that's what ultimately the current Fed forgot. So let's back up in the chronology here so our listeners can learn exactly what happens. He raises rates or he tightens the money supply. That sends rates higher the first time. But he does back off after inflation comes down initially. But then inflation starts creeping back and he really tightens the second time. And it caused a severe recession. As you said, 1982, I think the unemployment rate reaches almost 10 percent that year, somewhere in nine plus More than 10 percent. That's the highest since the Great Depression. There's a lot of other things going on there, too, right? We have Reagan's budget deficits. A lot of businesses are failing. That's a very concentrated time. We're talking a lot about monetary policy here, but there was a lot of other things going on, too, right? Well, in 1982, you had a crisis in governments like Mexico, which had borrowed money in dollars and couldn't and, and couldn't repay. And one of the things that Volcker does is lower the interest rate in 1982 to fight recession and argues correctly within the Fed that the mistake is made not by easing during a deep recession. You have to ease. You don't want to keep that easing too long. And that's why I I say again, easing in 1982, which he did, was not a mistake. Keeping rates too low for too long would have been, but he raised rates again in 1984. I can't say it too many times. (laughs) Preemptive restraint is what he taught Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen. But not Jay Powell. So, But not Jay Powell. Does Volcker deserve credit then for the Reagan boom? Because the economy was not doing very well in Reagan's first couple plus yeah, years. I, you know, I'm not, he, he contributed for sure. He contributed. I can't give him all the credit for the Reagan boom. And really, that's not something which I want to, I want to <laughs> give you a soundbite on. <laughs> well, no sound bites here. These are long form conversations. Well, okay. as you know, among the Reaganites, supply side economics, the tax cuts, they get the credit for the Reagan boom. I don't buy that argument. I think there was a lot going on there, including the fact that Volcker slashed rates after getting inflation under control. Without that, we might not have seen a Reagan boom. So Maybe, maybe. And again, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion on that. So no one today in their right mind would raise interest rates to, well, forget 20 percent, 15, 10 percent, and especially do it in so rapid a style. So what is Volcker's, what does his legacy tell us about what we should be doing today? I think one of the things that the Fed has to be ready to do is keep rates high for longer than they had anticipated. So Let me just circle back. Arthur Burns raised rates in 1974 and actually reduced inflation from 11% to 5%. It was a victory that was thrown away by lowering rates very quickly when unemployment went up. The current Fed must keep rates higher than they thought for longer in order to wring the inflation out of the system. You know, Wall Street doesn't like it, but Wall Street got addicted to a decade of zero percent. I mean, maybe the message to Wall Street is tough. No one really likes it when they see the S&P 500 and their Roth IRA or whatever they're using for the retirement fund drop 30 percent in a year. But maybe this is the medicine we need. Well, you know, there's one peculiarity which you don't hear of, and that is retirees live off fixed incomes. They can't live off anything when interest rates are zero. So I'm not so sure that it is politically a problem to keep rates at four or five percent for five years. After all, it will provide retirees with a reasonable income. So it's not 
the death knell that Wall Street would make it sound like. I would agree with you, even though, of course, I have no economic background. But, you know, a new neutral, once there's some predictability there and you know that rates aren't going to go anywhere, you can adjust to a four and a half or five percent rate, whatever it might be. You may not be an economist, but you sounded like <laughs> you knew what you were talking about. I like what you said. Well, that's because I've been listening to you for the past 30 minutes. Thank you, Bill Silber. My pleasure to be here and good luck, Martin. On the next episode of History As It Happens, inflation was one of the key issues in the midterm elections. And it was a big reason why Republicans expected a red wave. That did not happen. Was it a loss for Donald Trump? And what does the election say about the future of Trumpism? We'll go over that next as we parse the midterms with Damon Linker. As we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 